From the dawn of time, man has looked up at the sky and tried to understand the fundamental questions of our galaxy and beyond. The original pioneers for viewing our solar system were Charles Messier, a French astronomer who discovered a catalogue of deep space objects, and Galileo's discovery of Jupiter's and moons. Since then, humans have explored and photographed space with Voyager's journey through our solar system and the Hubble telescope's images from its camera. This video will show how to photograph our ancient night skies to capture the masses of stars by using different methods and devices. It takes just eight minutes for our sun's light to reach Earth. Conversely, the light from stars has to travel millions and millions of light years before our eyes can see it. Some stars have already died and don't have the energy to send a beam of light all the way through distant galaxies so we can see them. To us, the star fades away, but in reality, it's another cosmic explosion of a colossal sun. Information on stargazing can be self-taught, but for a real knowledge of the stars, find a local astronomical society like the one here in Kenley, South East London. This is William Botticci, the secretary of the Kenley Astronomical Society and an amateur astronomer. Uh, it was formed as far back as 1956, so a few years ago we celebrate our 50th uh, anniversary. The observatory first started being built around 1965, but it was towards the 70s when we had what's called first light, where you have the first look through the telescope. For a beginner in astronomy, just looking above at the constellations should give some basic knowledge of navigating around the night sky. A constellation is a collection of stars in an area that creates shapes of objects or creatures. This is the constellation of Gemini, or the Twins. The, um, there are 88 constellations in total, northern and southern hemisphere. You see about half at any one time, and of course the constellations change through the seasons. The most well-known one in winter would be Orion, and when you first start to see Orion, you know it's, you're approaching winter. Uh, that dominates the southern sky, and if you're in Australia, dominate the northern sky. But there'll be constellations around there. There'll be Taurus, and then. Uh, uh, Canis, major for the dog stars and uh, others around there. The telescope is an important tool for the astronomer and can allow the viewer to see planetary objects, star clusters or even galaxies. We've had a telescope quite a while. It was a Newtonian design, the basic kind of reflector which is 18 inches across. Very good views through that and it, for safety reasons it would have been best to have something more compact. There's a hybrid design which is a bit of both, which is what we have here at our observatory, a 14-inch uh, Smith Cassegrain. So now we've changed to a 14-inch. Uh, it costs more, it's very good quality. Uh, 14 inches is still large, but it's more versatile. The telescope at Kenley uses a GPS system to lock onto certain stars or planetary objects above and generally is the new way of navigating around the night sky. Two main kinds, which is the old-fashioned lens kind, the refractors, which are perfectly okay, and the reflectors, which are cheaper and larger. They're preferred because they're cheaper and they get a lot more light in. Quality-wise, they're about the same, but the reflectors tend to be larger than refractors because of the equivalent cost. Messier, uh, he was a Frenchman. He didn't have a very good telescope, but he did have dark skies because they had candles in there. So the thing was that he, um, he was looking for comets, that was his, his thing in astronomy. And he came up against this fuzzy blob objects. And the, the first one he, he found was what we, he now calls his catalogue number M, M1. And it goes up to about M110. And so those are the first things that when you first start looking with your telescope, that's what you look at and you can't really see them. You need to photograph them. Astronomy didn't take off until the camera came along, which is why at the moment we're so interested in getting a better camera. I've been pushing it, but there you go. Photographing our night skies, also known as astrophotography, 
can be achieved by using film cameras and digital cameras along with a range of webcams which are capable of capturing distant cosmic objects through a telescope. 35mm SLR cameras are good for letting in light which is needed for capturing points in the sky. The camera may be exposed from 20 seconds up to 5 or 10 minutes depending on how dark your area skies may be. Here are some examples of different exposures taken with a 35mm SLR camera. The advanced method of astrophotography and the most desired choice of photographing the night skies with a digital SLR. These cameras give you instant results with an advanced settings of different exposure times by changing the shutter speed and exposure of the camera. It's settings like these that save time developing film and spending time in the darkroom where sometimes your results were in vain. With a digital SLR, cameras can be used for time lapsing. Time lapsing is used to essentially speed up reality so something that is slow can be accelerated to appear to take just a few moments. To achieve this, an interval meter is introduced to expose an image every so many seconds. Ideally, a 20 or 30 second exposure should allow you to capture what your sky has to offer. Environmental conditions are vital for viewing the night sky and many things can occur which can ruin an evening's viewing. Conditions like cloud cover or even a bright moon can bleach out most of the skies above. Another environmental issue which is causing the decline of astronomers are the large amounts of light pollution from the bigger cities. On the horizon we can see a large orange haze which is from one of our major cities. In the UK it is the majority of the coastlines that are capable of dark skies. Astronomers also make a pilgrimage to Cornwall if any cosmic events such as the eclipse are occurring. North Norfolk is another very dark spot for stargazing due to the remoteness of the county. Photographing such areas will bring stargazers pointing out popular constellations rather than just seeing Orion, the hunter, and the plough within the cities. To escape this light pollution, many other European countries have clear nights the majority of the time. Portugal is one of these countries which have good night skies. One of the best astronomy areas in Europe lies in the Algarve of Portugal, which is located on their south coast. In a small town outside Porto Mayo, on the edges of the Monarch Mountains, lies the Central Astronomical Observatory known as the COAA. This astronomical society began in 1987, created by Dr Beverly Ewan Smith, an amateur astronomer, who originally lived in England, but now resides in the small town of Poio, where COAA are based. Um, now we fell in love with Portugal, really, that's the honest truth. We fell in love with the place and decided we wanted to live here. And uh, so we, we thought about the various things we might be able to do uh, that, you know, took advantage of the circumstances of the place. And I've always been interested in astronomy as, a, as an amateur. And uh, it seemed to me that this was a very good place for astronomy for a whole load of reasons. Being further south than the UK, a lot more of the sky is accessible. Uh, the weather's much better, so the temperature is more amenable. There are more clear skies. Um, and at that stage, not unfortunately so much today, there was much less light pollution. Light pollution is a plague which is, which is pretty much killed off astronomy in the UK. But in those days, there was very little outside lighting. Portugal was not particularly well developed and, and there was very little outside lighting so it was very dark here. We've got four reasonably big telescopes, one very large one. One's probably the largest in Portugal um, uh, and they're used depending on what people want to do. I mean our, our purpose is to provide the facilities and people come and use the, use the equipment. Um, there's a mixture really. Some people just come to, to observe visually. That means using an eyepiece on the telescope looking at things just visually for the experience of having seen these sort of really distant and extraordinary things. Um, but it's no question that you get a, a more interesting visual experience if you um, use some sort of integrating camera. Um, we, we have a range of, of camera types here to, to, to capture pictures. 
if the things are bright enough, that means solar system, the moon, the planets, um, then a webcam is, is rather good because most of the things in the solar system look pretty small, um, but they potentially have a lot of detail and they're very bright. So, um, so that's, that's the way to look at the solar system. Beyond that, things tend to be rather faint, and that means you're talking about long exposures in order to, um, to get enough light to make a picture that's any good. There's a sort of a, I can't call it a battle, but conflict between the people who want to look and the people who want to take pictures, um, the purists I call them, and so I'm always uh, in conflict with them because I want to put the camera on and actually see and take something home from an evening's viewing. But if we get the opportunity, well, then we'll put the camera on and take some pictures. If you can imagine all that information in an eyepiece this size, and you're looking at it with one eye, and you start to say to yourself, well, so what? And it's not, it's because your eye doesn't, it doesn't get any better while you're looking at it. But the camera, while the, the shutter is open, it's collecting light and information. And so what we need to do is to see what the camera's looking at. But this is um, a galaxy called M51, but it's, it's something that's 30 million light years outside our own galaxy. And here is another galaxy and is going, is being past this one but captured by gravity and is beginning to distort this one and gradually in the, full, in the fullness of time they'll cross one another and pull one another to pieces. And here is an object which we call uh, a planetary nebula and uh, this one is in the constellation Lyra and this is what will happen to our Sun when it reaches the end of its life and it will start to swell up and it'll absorb Mercury and Venus and get out to about the size of the Earth. And then the core will collapse into this tiny star in the center here called a white dwarf. And of course, it's, it's moving out at about 2,000 miles a second. An hour's drive west from the observatory, outside a small town of Sagres, lies the most southwesterly point in Europe, known as the end of the world. This description named before the discovery of America was thought to be the edge of the world. A lighthouse named after St Vincent still stands at the edge of the cliff safeguarding ships from danger. This area of the coastline is bare and only visited once a day by tourists viewing the sunset on the horizon. It's surrounding areas like these on the strip of the western coastline of Europe that you can see one of the best views of our night sky. With all these methods of viewing and capturing the night skies, man will continue to discover what lies in other galaxies by the only way they know how, through capturing its light in a single image.